Right, hello everybody. I, I'd like to um, give this talk in, in memory of Dr. Tony Whitten, who was very sadly killed uh, this last week in a bicycle accident. And he was one of the best thinkers in wildlife conservation in his work in the World Bank and in places like Fauna and Flo Fauna International. Because he, he developed ideas of developing small businesses in communities to help them protect their wildlife. He looked at incorporating ideas into belief systems. And most importantly, he, he, he talked about getting long, young people involved in wildlife conservation. And that's what this talk is about. And if he was here today, he would tell you that we're living through the largest extinction event in the Earth's history. This is the sixth uh, extinction, and probably the biggest of all of them, and this time caused by a single species, mankind. And young people intrinsically get this, more so often than their parents' generation, and they want to help. Uh, and that's what this project is, a, is about. I'm going to be talking about an organisation called Operation Wallacea, which is named after Alfred Russell Wallace, a contemporary of Darwin and the co-originator of the theory of evolution by natural selection, but also the father of biogeography, because he spent his life travelling around the world to remote locations like the Amazon and the, uh, uh, the Far East, and looking at the distribution of species. And there's an area of the world that's called the Wallacea region, uh, that's named after him, and that's where this organisation started work. And what they do is they fund academics, and we fund 200 academics and 75 PhD students, and that funding comes from tuition fees that are paid by students, 3,000 of them every year, who then go into these remote locations in the world and help those scientists. Now, is it real science? That's the first question. Well, that's an easy one to answer, because if it's not being published, it's not science. And we're only working from the beginning of June till the beginning of August every year. And so far, we've published actually 330 papers now, not 304, in peer-reviewed journals, including some high-impact things like uh, nature. So it's working from a science uh, viewpoint. And what it does, this method of funding, allows you to develop long-term data sets. Because if you apply for a grant, you'll get a grant for three years. That's it. At the end of that, you have to stop. Uh, whereas for ecology, you don't need three years' worth of data. You need five, ten, fifteen, twenty years' worth. And that's what this method of funding allows you to do. Now, there's no point just doing research to publish papers and plot the loss of biodiversity. So the whole idea behind this is to uh, structure the data so that it's in a form that can be then used for conservation intervention, if necessary. And if it is necessary, uh, then the scientists carry on monitoring to see if that intervention is actually working or not. So it's based on real science. So the question is, can students really help in this sort of work? Well, there are some ways they can help. So things like citizen science, which is where you train people uh, in a technique, and then you go off in the forest with supervision, for example, and then they collect data, and those data are then directly used in publications or management plans. Well, there's a limited range of things you can get students to do that are the first time in the tropics, but the, some of them, fortunately, are some of the most important bits that we have to do. So, for example, in a tropical rainforest, one of the most important bits of information you need to know is how much carbon is in there. Because about 20% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are coming from deforestation in developing countries. And so wealthy nations are then funding forestry departments in developing countries to get them to stop uh, deforesting, and the amount of carbon they save is then counted towards their national carbon budgets. And this is a huge business. So, for example, the Norwegians have given the Indonesians one billion dollars uh, in order to be used for carbon credits. So, when you go into a forest, one of the first bits of information you need to know is what carbon is in there. And for that, you need satellite data to look at the distribution of forests and forest types. Uh, and then you need lots of students to go in the forest and measure trees in standard plots. And you need two measurements, that's all. You need to know the diameter at breast height of the tree, which means putting a tape measure around it, and you need to estimate the height of the trees using a clinometer. Now, we know students can do that accurately because we've tested it and compared it with professional foresters, and the results are non-significantly different. Let's move to Africa. You're now in the middle of a reserve that's fenced. Three-metre fences, animals inside, people outside. That's been a very successful strategy in South Africa, so much so 
that in many cases the number of animals in those reserves has grown to such an extent they're now right up against the carrying capacity. So when you go there, the first thing the, the manager is going to ask you is, can you tell me what the carrying capacity of this reserve is? And for that, you need to know two bits of information. Firstly, what's in there now? And for that, you need students and lots of vehicles. And you drive around the reserve, and every time you see a mammal, you stop, and then you take the perpendicular distance from the trail to the animal, what species it is, male, female, condition, and then carry on. And what you're actually doing is a process called distance sampling. So if you're working on elephants, let's say you have an elephant standing on your trail, you'd have to be grossly incompetent not to see it. You've got a 100% chance. But as that animal moves away, that, that probability of observation will decline. And the shape of that curve depends on the habitat, because you can see elephants a lot more easily in savanna than forest, and partly on the type of species it is. A grey diker is much more hard to see, for example. So you do that, those curves for every species and every habitat, and it's all done automatically by computer, and you can then calculate exactly what's in there. Now, we know what the, how much food they need because that's published for every species. And if we're in there in the middle of winter, let's say we've got two months to go before it starts growing again, so we can calculate exactly how much herbage is needed. So then all you need to know is what's left in the reserve, and for that you need a line of students uh, walking through the reserve, picking every leaf off up to two metres in height, uh, and then uh, looking at the calorific value and total weight. Obviously, you have to have armed guards and training and so forth in order to do that, but it provides a very accurate way of working out exactly what the carrying capacity is. But there are lots of things students can't do. You can't send them into a Honduras cloud forest and ask them to count birds, because there's so many species, they couldn't possibly do it. And so for that, you have a leader, an expert, who's actually taking the data. But what the students are doing it is then helping to speed that up. So if you do a point count, what you actually do is you're going to record every species you hear or see over the next 10 minutes. So someone's scribing, someone's writing down the times of each species, someone's using range finders to estimate the distances, and someone's uh, looking all around the 360 degrees. So they're helping, they can speed that whole process up. And that's the case in many types of surveys. But don't get carried away with thinking that scientists are themselves uh, infallible, because they aren't. And this is a good example. Uh, there's a technique where you're looking for reptiles and amphibians in a forest. You walk through the forest and you search either side of a transect. And so we tested the efficiency of this by hiding um, plastic frogs and plastic snakes in a forest. And we then sent through students, and then academics, and then local guides to check how efficient they were. And the most efficient by a long way were the local guides, because they're much more used to seeing different shades of green in a forest. So wherever possible, we try to use uh, new technology so that we can have independent verification of the data sets. Well, let's assume you want to count fish on a reef. So you want to know how many fish are on a particular reef, you're going to use a technique called an underwater visual census survey. So you're going to dive down with your tape measure, and you're going to put it along, say, the 10-meter contour, and you're then going to stop for five minutes because you've scared the fish away. And now you're going to swim back a metre and a half above the tape, and you're going to count everything below you, and a metre and a half either side, in a cube going forward. So I'll play a little bit of video. I hope I'd like you to do it, please. I'd like you to count every fish that you see. I need a name for every fish. Don't miss any. They have to come in that box, and you have to get the length of every species. And that's just a short bit of film from Mozambique. Some of the reefs are much more complex than that. Using stereo video. Swimming along, he's recording the fish, and all the analysis is then done back in the lab. The students put the names of the fish below the, the pictures, and if they get it wrong, we know, because we have an image. And the software calculates the distance from the cameras to the fish. So if it doesn't come in your magic box, you don't count it. If it does, click on the front and back on one screen, and do the same on its mirror image, and it gives you the length of plus or minus 5%. Now, that's important, because the best you can do underwater is plus or minus 50%. And what you do is you take each of the lengths and cube them in order to get the weight of fish. So this is a much more accurate technique. Another one on reefs is, uh, a standard measure is how much coral cover is on a reef. So you dive down now with your tape measure again, and this time you're going to swim back along the tape, and every time it changes from a hard coral to a soft coral to a sponge, etc., uh, then you're going to note down the distance. And you'll do that 20, 30 times, and you'll come back to me and say, OK, the answer is 30% plus or minus 10%. But next year, it's declined to 
and you can't detect it because your sampling's not powerful enough. So what this technique does is you swim backwards and forwards with a GoPro and it produces a 3D image on your computer. And this is some dive gear we put on the, some sandy bottom and then measured the accuracy in all three dimensions and it's fantastically accurate. So that means you can take the reef out of the water and put it on your computer. And then instead of estimating coral cover, you can directly measure it. Now, if you're in a tropical rainforest, if you go to the Guyanese forest, for example, you've got a thousand bird species there. You have to know the calls of every bird species and the contact calls and the flight calls. And so you need a very high level of expertise. So a better way is to put out microphones in the forest and record the calls. And once you've done that, you can then... That's the, that's the screaming piha, a very common bird in the neotropics. Uh, you can then uh, have experts listen to it, or you can train the software to identify uh, the, the key species. So what are we doing all of this for? Well, firstly, to find new species to science, and we found uh, uh, many dozens of new species to science, including that new tarsier species, uh, which was found in one of the Indonesian forests, and that's a primate, undiscovered primate. Uh, and this last summer, we photographed this swallowtail butterfly in a, in a remote province in northern Fiji, and none of the experts can identify it. It appears to be a species new to science, and if it is, it's the first new species of swallowtail uh, in the last 50 years. That's the Linnaean shortfall, a lack of information on species. But we also ne need information on where existing species are around the world, and there's a lot of lack of information on that as well. This is called the Wallacean shortfall. And it's important because when you classify the conservation value of species, you do that uh, based to a large extent on their ranges. And in many cases, that's based on the guesswork. Now, in some cases, we can go in and find species in a much wider range than they're thought to be. In other cases, we find them in much less range than they used to be. So, the question was, can students really help in science uh, in the field like this? And I think the answer to that is yes. There are some things they can directly measure, and we use those data. There are many things they can help scientists with, speed up that whole process, and of course, they can also get involved in the new technology stuff. But sending students out there doesn't just get data, it changes people. If you put someone in a hammock in the middle of the Guyanese rainforest, surrounded by jaguars and pumas for two months, or get them diving on a remote reef, they come back changed people. And they come back enthused for protecting wildlife and their wildlife ambassadors. And that's, to a large extent, what we're trying to create, the next generation of wildlife ambassadors. Thank you.